All right. We're going to start with most of the discussion actually on pointing vector. All right. So you've probably seen it before, maybe a little bit different way, but um, we'll go through it anyway. So um, work is equal to force, just going back to basic physics, right? Force times distance. Okay. And usually that's written as F dot D. Those are little vector symbols there, it's supposed to be. And because the dot product is easy to work with, we can turn that around and say that that's D cross F. Now, uh, if we consider a charged particle, then a uh, charged particles exper experience what's called the Lorentz force. Uh, does anybody remember the Lorentz force equation? No, it's a good answer. Q E plus V cross B. Q is charge, E is electric field, B is velocity of the particle, and B is magnetic field. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Let's just label those velocity. And you know what uh, E and B are, and this is the charge. Can be plus or minus. Okay, back to here for a second. Uh, units of force and SI units are newtons. Units of um, D uh, displacement are meters. So the units of uh, work are newton meters. And that's equal to the number of joules, okay, as a measure of energy, energy. Okay. All right, now let's look at the electric component of the Lorentz force. Where we have maybe an electric field operating uh, in the horizontal dimension. And if we have a plus Q charge, <laughs> Q, then the force is in the direction of the charge, um, or is in the direction of the electric field. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and if we have a minus charge, then the force is in the opposite direction of the electric field. And if we have a positive charge um, and its displacement is uh, in some direction and its force is in this direction, then the dot product of D dot F E is here and that's equal to the work in the system. Okay, now with the magnetic field component, okay, uh, we can think of uh, the velocity as the change in the displacement with respect to time. And if I have a um, positive charge and uh, its velocity is in the same direction as the displacement we showed for the electric field and the magnetic field is in this dimension is in the horizontal direction then um, F B is equal to uh, Q V cross B, uh, what direction would that be in? V cross B into the board? Okay, so this would be in the uh, in direction. Okay, but this is um, perpendicular to D. Okay, so 
D dot F B is zero. So magnetic field component does no work. Interesting. Okay. That's like basic physics stuff. Okay. Now, uh, the rate of doing work is d dt d dot f is uh, with well-behaved systems partial of the displacement with respect to time times the force or the velocity dotted with the force. Okay. And uh, so for the electrical, we've got uh, V dot F E is equal to V dot Q E. Okay, for a single particle. Okay, for a system of moving charges, then we have rho V is equal to J where rho is the local charge density and V is its volume, or V is its velocity. Both can be functions of uh, position. And J is the, not the Jones vector here, J is the uh, current density. Okay, and uh, the units of J are charge coulombs over area times time. Okay, so um, <clears throat> now substituting in here for a system of particles, you can see we have V here, we have Q for a single particle. This would change into rho V, okay, for a system of moving charges. So the rate of doing work in a system of moving charges uh, with an applied electric field um, integrated over the volume uh, the volume of the um, some arbitrary volume is just J dot E dx cubed. Okay, it's just a volume integral of J dot E. Okay. And let's see, units of J dot E Is, uh, let's see, we did Coulomb, charge, area, meters squared, time, seconds, uh, and then the units of uh, electric field, volts per meter. Uh, so we have Coulomb, volts, and sometimes I write this out because we use V and these other things for visibility and stuff. So. Um, we will just write things out often. Okay, divided by uh, meter cubed second, Coulomb volt is a joule, and it's meter cubed second. Okay, a joule per second is a watt, so this is watt per meter cubed. Okay. And the units of dx cubed, 
The uh, differential of the, of the integral is meter cubed. So the units of the integral are watts or total power. OK, so this power represents the conversion of energy from the electrical, electromagnetic, electrical or electromagnetic wave um, in the system to either thermal or mechanical energy. Okay. Any questions so far? So far, this is pretty, pretty easy to follow basic physics stuff. Okay. All right. So now we're going to apply one of Maxwell's law. We're going to apply what we call the Ampere. Amp it has an E in there. Ampere. Uh, Maxwell. law to determine, oh, to, I'm sorry, to eliminate J, okay? And uh, that's del cross H um, minus uh, the derivative of the displacement is equal to j. So we'll just substitute that in for j. Okay. So the integral over the volume of j dot e dx cubed is the integral over the volume of, let's see, what have we got? Uh, j dot e. So this dot e, so del cross h um, and we'll put the E on this side just because it's convenient for me. Uh, minus E um, dot uh, derivative of the displacement current with respect to time, partial there. Okay. And then uh, dx cubed. Okay. Nothing but substitution so far. Okay. Now we're going to apply the vector identity uh, del dot E cross H is equal to H dot del cross E minus E dot del cross H. Okay, and so we get that this is then equal to uh, working on this one here. Okay, um, and what we're going to do is uh, do the E, uh, substitute in for this guy the rest of the expression, okay, in that vector identity. And so what we get is H dot del cross E minus del dot E cross H minus E dot this, uh, derivative of the displacement current. Okay, so we're just about there. So now we can apply the divergence theorem. Nope, oh, nope, 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 nope. Okay, nope. One of the other Maxwell equations apply here. My, this del cross E is minus B um, partial with respect to time. Okay, so um, we're going to assume a couple of things here. Oh, well, write it down. H dot partial B dt minus del dot, it's a minus sign, uh, E cross H minus E dot 
partial d with respect to time, dx cubed. All right. Now, um, realize it's okay, so we can do a little bit more on this. Ah, can I get rid of the minus sign? Let's bring it over to the other side. Minus integral volume j dot e dx cubed is equal to, mm, let's see, let's do this, del dot e cross h minus partial or plus partial with respect to time of h dot b uh, plus e dot b. Okay. Dx cubed. All right. Do you, does anybody recognize this one? This part of the bracketed expression? You should have gone over this in your 501 class. Does anybody know? That's the total energy in the E and M fields. Okay. I, that's another lecture to do that, so I'm not going <laughs> to do that here. But this is the total energy in the E and M fields. Within the volume. Okay. I, it would be. Thank you very much. No wonder you didn't recognize it. If I would have written that correctly without the typo there, you would have got it, right? Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay. All right. Almost there. Okay, now we apply the divergence theorem here. Okay. Um, okay, and we have minus integral of the volume of j dot e dx cubed. We are assuming that things are linear here. But these are our normal assumptions, okay, uh, with the fields. Okay, so what I have now, I'm going to break this out into two integrals. We're going to apply the divergence theorem to this part of the uh, volume integral that turns into an integral over the surface with the application of the divergence theorem to E cross H dotted with the normal uh, to the uh, surface. I'll explain that in a minute. And then this is plus, and I want to use the symbol a script u, okay? That's not a mu. I'm not trying to make it a mu. It is a script u, okay? Uh, okay. okay, so picture this here, guy. Okay, this is our volume. This is our surface and I have an outward facing normal in hat that varies as I go over the surface. Okay, so that's what that is. Okay, so now pointing, a guy named pointing actually, with uh, P-O-Y and T-I-N-G, uh, said, oh, well, that's uh, kind of a cool vector. That, we're gonna call that the vector S. Okay, and that's a surface integral. Okay, so let's take the case where there's no charges. Okay, then this surface integral is equal to the uh, change in the electromagnetic energy in the volume. Okay. Now, if the units here are, um, what do we say? This is watts, right? 
and this is meter square units. What are the units of S? If what you know, we set up somewhere the units of the J dot E dot uh, J dot E integrator of the volume is watts. So this is half. This integral has to be watts power. Then what's the units of S? Watts per meter squared. Very good. Okay. So when we take some electromagnetic wave and pass it through a medium, and we can do this uh, E cross H of the field incident onto the surface and then out of the surface, okay, too, you have to do the whole surface integral, then that's the change in the electromagnetic energy in the volume. So that would be like absorption, okay, in the volume. Now, uh, <clears throat> let's just uh, think about this. What if we had a medium that, um, okay, the way this is usually done. is not to really think about the volume, okay, but to think about the surface just a surface, okay? And we usually think about it in terms of a uh, plane wave coming into a surface where we have maybe an N1 and an N2 refractive indices, okay? And we talk about S as being um, E cross H, and realize here I've written this in terms of the real E, okay, not the U. We'll get to that in a minute, okay, but this has all been with respect to the real fields. And in well-behaved media, this linear, isotropic, homogeneous, non-magnetic, etc., media uh, classes, basically, um, metals, um, then... Uh, let's say our E is here. Where's our H? Out of the board. Okay, that's supposed to be an arrow point, arrowhead pointed at you. Okay. Yeah. So E cross H is in the direction. Of, um, of K, all right, and if we're incident onto a surface, then um, <clears throat> S is going to depend on this, uh, or this, not S, but S uh, dot N which is the component of the uh, energy per unit surface area on the surface is going to change with respect to this angle. Okay. So um, we call usually the magnitude of um, this dot product of S and the surface normal, the irradiance. Okay, and its units are watts per meter squared. Now in this um, really simple example here with a single surface and a single plane wave, then S dot N is just equal to the magnitude of S times the cosine of the incident angle. 
Okay, and that kind of makes sense. If I have, you know, some number of watts per square meter incident onto a plane surface perpendicular to K, and if I tilt the surface, I'm kind of stretching out the area over which each of the, you know, solid angle, if you want to think about it, components of the wave are incident onto the surface. So I reduce the irradiance, the watts per square meter, by that cosine theta. Okay, um, we're going to get uh, real interesting here in a minute, okay? Uh, but I want to ask if there's any questions on this part of it yet. So that's where irradiance comes from. Pointing there. Yeah. Where does that strip U come in? That's the uh, energy change in the volume. So if we're talking about, you know, absorption in this volume, then uh, that will change from one side of the surface to the other. So, you know, over here, my output um, value of the pointing vector, let's call that uh, in hat one and then in hat two, that'll change, you know, through the medium, okay? Because if there's absorption, then uh, if this isn't zero, then uh, something's got to change about the wave when you pass through it. Okay. All right. So now, what about two waves? Okay. Let's take the example and uh, actually... Let me do it this way. Let's take this example. Okay. Uh, onto a surface. Let's call the surface here. You've got um, K1 hat. and K2 hat. Okay. So, um, I'm going to define A1 hat like this. And, uh, I'm sorry. Yep, A2 hat like this. Okay. Now, what do we know about uh, the combination of those two waves. We already know a lot. Uh, the sum of the vectors should be the direction of energy flow. Yeah, okay, so that's this way, assuming that K1 and K2 have the same wavelength, right? That's K sum. So if I choose my z-axis here and my y-axis here, that means that the energy flow should be in the z-direction. Okay. And anything else? Combination of two plane waves. Fringes. Fringes. What about the fringes? Um, in the uh, K1 minus K2 direction. Oh. Okay. The K delta is in the K1 minus K2 direction. Um, fringes are perpendicular to K delta, right? And the spacing of the fringes is 2 pi over mag 2 to K delta. Okay. That's true if there are fringes, if their visibility isn't zero. And the way I've drawn it, it kind of looks like visibility might be zero, but uh, depending on the angle here, the visibility may be zero or not, right? Okay. If there's no visibility, does that mean there's no power flow? No. Okay. Um, so, uh, we do know that there might be a reduction in visibility due to the polarization visibility factor, though. Okay. So, we can write our equation right off the top of the bat here. I total 
is I1 plus I2 plus 2 square root I1, I2, P1, 2 cosine of K delta dot R. And I've assumed that you know some, those other phase factors are zero for now. You can stick them in if you want. All it does is just change the position of the fringes, the offset. OK. And um, let's see, U1 is, um, let's say it's an amplitude A, E to the J, K1 dot R minus omega T, A1 hat. And U2 has the same amplitude, just to make it easy, E to the J, K2 dot R minus omega T, A2 hat. OK, so um, let's see. Let's think about it. What is I1 and I2 here? And we have to think about I1 and I2 on our measurement surface. These are our radiance values. Yes? Yeah, we haven't talked about, yes, it is. OK, <laughs> yes, it is. Um, oh, I haven't, I forgot to go through the complex pointing vector, but I'll go through it in a minute. Let me make sure that's still OK. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, with respect to, let's say with respect to I0, let's call it, which is the normal incidence irradiance. Okay. How would I1 and I2? Well, first of all, they're equal angles the way I've drawn it. So I1 and I2 are the same value, right? Okay. But we know that I1 and I2 are reduced with respect to I0 because we're coming in at an angle. So what would that um, value be for I1 and I2? Just the cosine. OK. So this is I0 cosine of that angle. OK. So we'll call that beta, direction cosine, and zero beta. All right. So then this would be I total would be, uh, let's see, when we work everything to, through, it's uh, 2 beta I0 times 1 plus P12 cosine of K delta dot R. OK. And then uh, I0 we can put in terms of A um, just from the impedance relationship between uh, E and H. Uh, we have this is, OK, I'm going to bring the beta out front. Um, this is beta times one half C n epsilon naught a squared. So I have a factor of two here. So this is beta times C n epsilon naught magnitude of a squared one plus P one two cosine of uh, K delta dot R like that. OK? And we can work through what K delta is in different cases. And you know, if these waves are symmetric around Z, then um, uh, we find out that the fringe spacing is a really easy relationship with respect to this angle. Uh, we don't have to go through that. Um, and there could be a reduction in the visibility due to P12. All right. So that, that we could basically already do, except probably what you didn't know is this, right? 
one thing I really haven't talked about. Okay? Um, and that's with respect to the measurement surface. Now, let's go through our pointing vector stuff. And what I'm going to use is the complex pointing vector, which is just a little different. Um, in the complex pointing vector, uh, it's just S is equal to um, 1 half uh, U cross H star. Uh, for, and this has to be for harmonic fields. And that's what we do with in this class where you've got an e to the minus j omega t factor in both uh, ways. Okay. So what we find, interestingly, is that when we do this, we have s is equal to c n epsilon naught magnitude of a squared. And... Um, I'm going to spare you all the algebra. It's, it's messy. Okay, it's doable, but messy. Uh, times beta. Look, that's the same factor we have here. Okay, and uh, this is 1 plus, oh, it's, it, but it's really interesting because I have a um, two components here. I have a beta, 1 plus cosine of 2k gamma y, which uh, this is just 2k gamma uh, y here for k delta dot r. So uh, it's only modulating in the y direction there. And that's the real part of the complex pointing vector. Okay. Well, that agrees with, you know, our radiance um, calculation. And most people just take the real part of the complex pointing vector, okay, to get the irradiance. But there's another component, okay. It's uh, plus J gamma sine of 2K gamma Y complex. Okay. Now, I can't say that I totally understand all this. Okay. But I think that this is similar to the volt amp reactive. If you're an electrical engineer, you may know that's like energy stored in a capacitor. It's very important for power line problems, uh, matching impedances or something like that. Um, it, it may not be a real power flow. Okay, it's kind of like stored energy. Okay, well, why do we have that? Okay, well, let's look at this situation for an angle theta of, uh, of 30 degrees. That means uh, that here uh, K1 and uh, K2 are both uh, 30 degrees there. I guess... Uh, the sign convention, this would actually be a minus 30 degrees. Okay. Like that. Okay. Get the right program here. Here we go. Okay. So here's the real power flow. And that goes right along the z direction, just like we thought. And the power decreases as the cosine uh, when you go along y with the centers here uh, equal to the fringe spacing, just like we thought. Here's the reactive power, OK? And it's uh, active in the uh, zero portion of the pointing vector. The pointing vector has a real zero, okay? But now up here, if P12, I'm sorry, it looks like P sub R. <laughs> it's P12. If P12 is unity, then we know that this has unit visibility, right? 
it actually goes to zero, the irradiance goes to zero, but with P12 non-zero, and P12 would be non-zero with the P polarization incident on the interface. Okay? So we know that P12 is non-zero. Okay? So although the pointing vector says the real part of the pointing vector has a zero, okay, here along the zero of the fringes, we know that irradiance is not zero along those fringes in that, in that minimum spot. It's minimum, but it's not zero. That's reactive power. Okay? Don't have a good explanation of that yet. Okay? But that's what it is. All right? Not too many people talk about beams combining with pointing vectors. Uh, beam combination and pointing vectors is not a, not a popular subject. And I'm beginning to understand why. But that's interesting, isn't it? Okay. So um, now, what about the case that we talked about right at the beginning of class, where we have uh, two waves? Oops, did I erase it already? Uh, two waves going in opposite directions. Okay. Two linear polarizations in opposite directions. So let's, take, let's just draw that one on the board real quick. If my K1 is this way, then S1 of that vector would go that way, right? And uh, if K2 is in this direction, then S2 is in this direction. So how about power flow across that surface, some arbitrary surface there? The, S, the power flows are different, okay? At real power is zero but we still have a standing wave. We know that. We know that if we put a charge there, if we put a detector or something that responds to electric field like, let's say, a photoresist, okay, which is sensitive to light, exposure of light like film, okay, if you remember what, you guys might not even know what film is, okay. Um, now everybody uses uh, CCDs, right, which is good, okay, or CMOS. But yeah, so if you put a light sensitive material there, it will respond, okay. So, what about this pointing vector thing? It turns out, if you do the calculation, which I have, uh, gee, hold on a second. I think it's, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. It's this one. Real power flow, zero. Reactive power flow, exactly the way the fringes are located, okay? So it's like stored energy there, okay? Power isn't actually flowing, it's just kind of sitting there going mm. Okay, all right. So I would love for somebody to pick up on this. I don't have a lot of time right now, but if one of you are interested, I'd love for you to go through some cases with me and, and uh, look at this in a little bit more detail, if anybody's interested. I can't pay you, okay? And I don't have a lot of time to work with you, but uh, if you're interested, it might be kind of fun. Okay? All right, so that was my lecture on irradiance. Do you have any questions? Maybe I raise more questions than answers here, but, you know, that's what it is. Okay. Just a quick question there for the equation for the pointing vector. Yeah. Is there a, a beta outside of the bracket as well as inside the bracket? Oh, no, no. Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, anything else? Yeah. So if, they, if you had two wavelengths, or two waves that did not have the same wavelength, you would have a real power flow as well as a similar irradiance distribution that you got here. <laughs> okay, so you would have a traveling standing wave. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, actually we can, we can show something about that. So let's take uh, the GV demo and uh, make one wave at different wavelengths going in the opposite direction. Okay, so we've seen this guy before. 
See? This is the guy here. The time average. Okay? And what is the time average going to do? It's still going to oscillate. It's never going to not oscillate. Yeah, look at it. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe it eventually... No, 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 no. Okay. All right. I was wrong about that. So this is the magnitude of E squared. It's going this way instantaneously. So eventually this will average to a constant. Yeah. But you could, depending on the, on the um, difference in wavelengths, if the difference in wavelengths was very small, you could actually detect this as a beat frequency. And it'd be really interesting to look at that in terms of the point of complex point of All right. So, anything? Yeah, I mean, you can see it's kind of averaging out there. Okay, anything else? All right, that's it. By the way, this, none of this is going to be on an exam. <laughs>